Welcome back to the podcast. My guest this week is Michael Antonelli. Michael is a market strategist for Baird's Private Wealth Management Group and the author of the Bull and Baird blog. Michael, thank you for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm uh, super excited to be here. Got a fun conversation here today. Uh, I'm excited too. I got this note from our mutual friend, Economic, and he said something along the lines of like, I'm glad I know you in real life because I know that you're not as pessimistic as you come across online. I saw this note and I was really taken aback because I don't see myself that way at all, right? I mean, I'm not especially bearish. I'm certainly not a perma bear. I think yeah. I am, you know, in a lot of ways, a contrarian, but I try to reason, you know, ground up, not just take the the contrarian position, like, you know, and, and sometimes I end up with a contrarian position. Um, when valuations are favorable or if they're unfavorable, yeah, I just call it like I see it. Um, but, you know, that kind of got in my head and I noticed I've been doing a lot of doom and gloom commentary. And I wanted to balance it out. I wanted to talk about the bull case. I wanted to talk about positivity. And I don't think there is anybody online that I interact with that is as effective at delivering positivity and the bull case as as you. And, and that's that's a really high compliment. You know, we we go online, we're all being like funneled into these like negative thinking patterns. That's that's just a fact. And you know, to try to stay positive, to try to stay in you know, thoughtful conversations or, you know, whatever it is, it, it's always, it's swimming upstream, right? You're always getting pushed down into, you know, either politics or negativity or different things. It's not easy. So I wanted to hear your story and I wanted to see, you know, if that was something that just comes natural, if it's something you've had to work on. Um, and I thought we'd talk a little bit about about the markets and about, you know, the bullish case, um, but really wanted to hear kind of how you got there. So, um, you know, if you want to just kick it off, I know you started as an equity trader before really finding your voice. If you wanted to tell a little bit of that to the audience. Yeah, I'll get, we'll do a, a quick background just so they can be on the same page with me and they can understand kind of where my thought process come from. So I did start as an equity trader in 2007. So right before the GFC, I set ground level to like one of the worst crises uh, this country has ever seen financially. So um, I, I really wanted to be an equity trader my whole life. I went to the University of Chicago. I got an MBA. I'm like, I just want to be an equity trader institutional. So I was really an institutional salesperson, right? Equity trader in the sense of I would interact with hedge funds and pension funds. I would get orders from them um, and, and I would help execute their orders on behalf of Baird. So I really did enjoy that job. And here is a uh, part of me that I want everybody to know. My brand, this bull and Baird, this blog that I created, this video series that I do as part of uh, Private Wealth Now for Baird, uh, it, it essentially started because I needed to update my clients on what happened overnight? What what happened in the markets? And every every equity trader writes a recap and nobody reads them. Right? Phil, there's like there's like 10 million of these things. Nobody reads them at all. It's just like this is what happened. This is what CPI did. Blah blah blah. Nobody reads them. I understood that after my first month of nobody opening my email, and I decided, you know, I'm just going to start writing in a plain language, and I'm going to start writing with using pop culture references and sports references, and I'm going to make it digestible, readable, and I want to make it plain language. And all of a sudden, I had 4,000 people on it, including editor of the Wall Street Journal, CEOs, bankers, private wealth managers, traders, all of them. And it was just because my style was very approachable. And I think that's my first lesson to you and to everybody listening on Wall Street in particular, being approachable and digestible, it really is a super powerful. When you talk about, uh, like, I have a tendency to get deep in the weeds. I like I like being deep in the weeds. I enjoy it. I think, you know, I like the intellectual rigor and, and, you know, but but we start talking in a language of, you know, oh, gee, I should have bought more theta on that trade, right? Yeah. When, you know, you get to expert, you start talking in this language that is very comfortable and common for us. And I think it also kind of creates a little bit of a, an aura of um, intellectualism. Yep. That is, you know, we're talking about simple concepts. Most of the time in finance, when you see people using, you know, big, complicated words, the, the core concepts are very simple. So I, you know, are you talking about like the language that you're using, like like just avoiding the lingo or you know the messaging, no. or, or you know how does that translate? I do try to avoid the lingo, especially in my current role. But in my previous role, I would have to talk about earnings and and estimates and all those things that that move the institutional world because my audience at that point was institutional equity traders and and portfolio managers per se. But you know, we are all surrounded by these words like duration and convexity, and they mean something to 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 real you know sophisticated finance sites, but really what, what they're trying to say are, are simple topics, right? But we just use these complex words. Let me give you an example. So why does the stock market go up and down on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? I just like, just pick a day, Phil. Why does the stock market go up and down? You could say, well, you know, there are expectations that are changing. You could say that um, that piece of news came out and it changed the, 
the you know the present value of the future cash flow like you could say all those things that that you know are from a textbook and are from you know from from finance twitter or whatever but here's the actual reason that the stock market goes up and down on a day-to-day -day basis it's asking itself are things getting better are things getting worse or are things staying the same that's really all it's doing and you know what the, another fancy term for that is second derivative but i don't want to say second i don't want to say rate of change second derivative i just want to say are things getting better are things getting worse or are things staying the same? And I think once you can distill things down into simplicity and people can understand it, you really cracked the code of being an effective communicator. You said to me that during COVID, everything changed in terms of your blog, in terms of your messaging, in terms of what people were responding to. What, what happened exactly there? Yeah. So COVID, tough time. I mean, it was a really, really tough time. We both sat witness to the market essentially crashing. I mean, the Dow was down 11% in one day. That's, that's, that's frankly absurd. And it's hard for human beings, especially in the private wealth world, to put that into context because it's easy to get overwhelmed with fear. What's happening? I'm afraid of going outside. I'm afraid of going to the supermarket. Uh, the market's crashing. The treasury market's crashing. Like everything was really falling apart. And I spent the better part of my time in my home, like everybody else, trying to figure out how to put the stuff into context. So our clients wouldn't, wouldn't just spiral into too much negativity. And here's what I found. And this became my guiding light. I found, Phil, that instead of talking to them about the things that were going wrong, I was going to talk to them about the world and how beautiful it is. And, and I was going to give them a recipe and I was going to give them a, an inspiring quote. And I was going to give them a picture of a, a beautiful garden in Asia, something that would take their mind off of what was happening. And we labeled it Good News Gazette, me and two of my coworkers, we labeled it Good News Gazette. And we published it every single day in 2020. And our list grew from a couple of people to 100 people to about 500 people. And I will tell you, that became my calling card that, hey, the world seems dark and scary, but in actuality, there is beauty and we're going to get through this together. And I had like, people who pay us, okay, clients, people who are the most important to us, come up to me afterwards and say, that got me through one of my darkest moments. And so I realized that, why should I just be another cog in the pessimism machine? There's a million people that do that. Why can't I be some sort of beacon or some sort of light to help people look at the other side? Because there's always, always, always something to be hopeful about. At the end of the day, you know, in finance, in markets, like what we're doing, a lot of it is just trying to, okay, what is the the value of something? What is the direction of something? What is the value of something? What is right? And you have to be, you know, a cold hard analyst, right? You have to be, you have to be objective. You have to say, okay, something is overvalued, something is undervalued, right? And like positivity is a great mindset. Obviously, people react to it and and it's 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 hard and 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 it you know, there's a lot. Of, and, and look, the arc of history bends towards, right, the, you know, we, we course correct as people and, yeah. and, you know, people who bet on positivity are going to do better. But we also have to be cynical, right? In some ways, we have to, you know, audit financials, right? We're, yep. you know, somewhere in the in the process, we have to, um, we have to call it like it is when things are, you know, you know, overvalued. So, you know, you can't like start with the conclusion and work there. So how do you balance that? How do you work that into your analysis in your messaging? It's a great question. And I'm going to go in the following way. I think that most arguments about the stock market are people with different time frames yelling over each other. And I think that's important to digest. And I think that was said by Morgan Housel, who's a good friend of mine. People with different time frames arguing over each other. You and I might get online, Phil, and we might talk about the stock market today, and you might care about it for the next month. You might say, gosh, where's it going over the next month? Where's it going over the next quarter? When I'm out here thinking, where's it going over the next decade? So we are both talking about the same thing, which is the market, but we're thinking about it in different ways. How do you how do you blend optimism with pessimism? I think you have to understand that optimism doesn't mean that you think everything's great and perfect and, wow, let's just trust everybody and, wow, we're all going to be fine. Optimism generally means that you think things get better slowly over time, that, that humanity's ability to solve problems improves over time, but that does not, does not mean that we will not have setbacks along the way. And that's the biggest problem with optimism in that, you know, bad news happens overnight, okay? Things crash overnight. COVID happens over, things happen overnight, which is why pessimism is so seductive because, wow, that was bad. Do you know how long it took the iPhone to get created? It took a decade's worth of metallurgy. It took a decade's worth of ceramics. It took a decade's worth of electronics. Slow improvements that all of a sudden there's an iPhone and it changes the world. So 
when when I think about the market and the things you're saying, I acknowledge that yeah, maybe this this um this data point seems bad over the short run. Maybe this uh maybe this company um once they opened the books ended up being a fraud. That happens all the time. All all the time. But that doesn't change my view that we get slowly better over time and I want to participate in that. There's this idea of of duck imprinting that like you can almost you can almost predict people's uh, views on the markets based on their vintage, like when they first started in a yeah. market, first big experience. So people who yeah. started, you know, during a bull run are, are always, you know, they they think that's that's the natural state of things, and we're always going to go back. People that start during the uh, tech bubble have been calling for a tech, you know, a tech collapse for for a long time. Um, you said that you started during the global financial crisis, yet you seem to have avoided that trap of thinking that everything is the next global financial crisis. That's, so that's the historian in me, basically. So I was an undergrad in history, which remarkable, Phil, that my uh, undergrad was uh, in history of all things. And I'm a, in the finance world as a trader and, and, a, and a market strategist. But I think that it is the most important thing. And that is being able to put into context what happened and then being able to be a good storyteller. I think those are powerful, uh, powerful tools, not only for my job, but honestly, frankly, any job. Um, I, so I'm a Gen Xer. I'm, I'm 50. Uh, I turned 50 last year. Uh, I am a product of a lost, lost decade. Like Bill, I, I, 2000 to 2000. And, uh, so from 2000, all the way through the GFC through 2010 was a lost decade, right? That was the stock market went essentially nowhere. Um, and that hurts, right? That hurts to have lived through. But I think part of the historian in me and a part of the storyteller in me understands that the world is never the same. It, 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 it actually will never be the same in terms of what we see, I do know that we're going to have a, two bear markets every decade, one recession every decade. I do know that the world will break, fully, fully break at least once a decade. I've come to just expect that. And that is another lesson I want to put out is that I believe in expectations more than forecasts. I really do. I think forecasts are a difficult thing to get right. There's, there's almost nobody in the Hall of Fame. So I have what's called expectations, and I just rattled some off. Two bear markets every decade, one recession every decade, the world to fully break once a decade. And if I expect that, much like in winter in here in Wisconsin, I can prepare for it. I can understand that when it arrives, I expected that to happen. So that that to me helps me get through this kind of bias I have as a, as a young investor that I grew up in a really tough time. Right, right. So with that, with that framework, right? So if you say two bears a decade and one, you know, Real One recession every yeah. decade. Are we not overdue? Does that like you know? Do you not worry that hey, you know the the clock is ticking on this time bomb? I'm I'm promoting a market that that could be susceptible to that. I mean, how do you you know? It's a tough thing to to balance. So I just I've said this a few times on Twitter recently. Uh, when I have engaged with people who are calling top or calling bubble or whatever, I'm like, we just had a bear market. We literally just had one. 2022 was a full on bear market. Okay, so we just had one. Some people don't call 2020 a bear market. They call it a crash. Um, but if we're going to define a bear market as a drop of 20%, it did happen in 2020. So technically, in this decade, we've already had two. Um, again, you could nitpick whether 2020 was a bear market. But let's just go back to the recession. Yeah, you would think that if there's one recession a decade, was 2020 a recession? I mean, 20 million people lost their jobs. It would be I would be hard-pressed to say that 2020 was not a recession. So... Um, have we had both of those? Yes. So I I want to push back against people who are who are overly negative right now and say we literally just had a bear market. It is super 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 rare to have back to back bear markets all the way back to the 1920s. It's super rare. I mean, outside the Great Depression, um, outside the gosh 2000 2003, like it's super rare to have back to back bear markets. So I want to. I want to have that evidence-based investing, that that expectations be my groundwork, and then be able to say to somebody, we just had one. Why are you calling for another one 12 months later? Well, we had one, but it was it was just so unusual in in you know the the pace of the recovery. Um I mean, do you th do you think the Fed over overshot uh, you know, with some of their policies? And 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 if you do. Do you think there are going to be unintended consequences that are still, you know, that are starting to play out or, or will be playing out? Or do you think they hit it right? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I, I'm just going to, before I answer it, I'm going to say that I think that, you know, the, the Fed is full of people doing their best, right? I, I think that we often neglect that. These are, it's full of people who are doing their absolute best to try to manage what is essentially something that's unmanageable, and that's the U.S. economy. So 
a, a 36 trillion dollar entity full of you know 300 million people with changing expectations by the moment that's not an easy task and in fact they even forecast a recession that didn't happen so um they probably had did the i think that during COVID, i think they did a great job saving the system and i and i do think that the lesson from 08 and from 2020 is that the powers that be will do anything they can to preserve the system i, I think that's true um and again what we have to think of if there was a million different outcomes did we get one of the best outcomes right if there's a million outcomes from march of 2020 is this a top quartile outcome i think it probably is what would be a bottom quartile outcome we do nothing and we're in a great depression right now um so there's a multitude of outcomes that could have happened did they make a mistake in 2021 absolutely i think that having their foot on the accelerator while people were buying pet rocks on the internet for two million dollars was probably um maybe maybe a little tone deaf to what was happening in the risk world but um you know, they did hike rates. They did hike them as faster, I think, than in history to get in 2022, which is what caused that shock in that bear market. Um, do I think what they're doing now is correct? Yes. I mean, they're not, they aren't talking about cutting anytime soon. The market wants it, but they're not talking about cutting. Um, and we're starting to price out cuts this year. So I just want to say that I think that the Fed gets a lot of blame. They get a lot of credit, but they are just people, just like you and I, trying to manage uncertainty, which is in, in something like the U.S. economy is extremely difficult. Let, let me throw you a couple of, I think, the most common or the, in my opinion, most valid um, complaints or, or warnings of, of where we are in a cycle in the market. And, you know, let's see if you can kind of put my mind at ease and say, yeah. hey, you know, this, again, maybe it's a time frame concern, but, but you know, it doesn't mean that the world is necessarily ending. Um, f- first one I'll say is, you know, the debt service of, of the federal government is is spiking with interest rates high and debt high. Uh, there doesn't seem to be um, a realistic plan to to start paying back the debt, right? I mean, we're not balancing the budget anytime soon. So it's just this thing that's growing and the fragility of the system is now, you know, if rates have to go yet higher, um, you know, we're going to be talking about 20% of GDP uh, of, of the federal budget just on debt service, let alone paying it off, um, you know, the, the, the federal debt per taxpayer is now about a quarter of a million dollars and unfunded liabilities are exponentially higher than that. Why would I, why should I not be running around, you know, oh my God, the world is ending, the world is ending, you know, kind of put me at ease about that. Yep. Great question. And I'll just preface this by saying I and my partner, we do a series called All That Matters. It's on Baird's YouTube channel. We talked about the national debt, if anybody's interested in hearing Kind of my full views. Uh, I have about a 13 minute video about the national debt on on that channel. Uh, I, so I just pulled up Fred. I, I'm looking at interest as a percent of gross domestic pro- gross domestic product. So what the um, what our interest payments are as percent of our economy. Uh, they are about 2.4 percent right now, uh, and that was at the end of March of this year. Uh, they peaked at 3.1 percent in 1991. So we're still below the peak of interest payments as a percent of our economy. They have certainly started to skyrocket they are up from about one and a half to to two and a half in gosh about three or about three years so interest payments are starting to move i I think that um i will say this i will say this uh so the united states runs a credit-based economy which means that think of our economy as a balance sheet okay assets liabilities in order for the economy to grow both sides of the balance sheet have to grow there's only two entities that can grow the liability side the public sector and the private sector okay just those two Um, And there's something called the paradox of thrift, which means if one starts to save, the other can't also save. So if the private sector is saving, the public sector has to produce liabilities. If the public sector, the government starts to save, then the private sector has to start producing liabilities or else the economy shrinks. Um, We're growing the debt too fast. I think that's objectively true. That's objectively true. The deficit's too large. We're growing it way too fast. is the nat- will the national debt ever shrink? No, it never has in our history. It never will. Okay, that's, let's just get that out of the way. It will never shrink. If it shrinks, that means the government is saving and the economy is shrinking, right? We, it's a balance sheet. It either has to grow or shrink. So if it's shrinking, the national debt is shrinking, our balance sheet is shrinking. I will just end it with this. I don't know. Nobody knows the answer to how much debt is too much debt. Nobody knows the answer to what will happen um, if, if interest rates rise and our interest payments continue to soar. Um, I put it this way, Phil, and I want everybody to really pay attention here. There's probably 400 worries, Phil, that you should have about your money, okay? Maybe 400, about your investments, your money. And they're ranked as a spectrum, right? From one to 400. What's number one? 
Number one is how much you save and spend. And I'm talking about your money, okay? Number two might be what the Federal Reserve is doing with interest rates. Number three might be um, how the housing market is doing, right? Number four might be how the you know, earnings estimates, uh, but we're ranking them, we're ranking them, right? When you walk out the door from your house, how much do you worry about a tree branch falling on your head and killing you? <clears throat> None, right? But it's, it's on your spectrum, right? It is in your list of risks that could kill you. It's probably number a thousand. Number one is cancer. And number two is your health, right? Back to my analogy. Where's the national debt and interest payments of the United States of America rank in terms of threats to your money? Is it, is it number 200? Is it 250? Like, where does it rank on the spectrum? And if it's number 200, how much are you going to actually worry about it as opposed to just talking about it on Twitter and making content and we get to, we, you know what I mean? So I call that a spectrum of worries. And when I talk to our clients, I say, you could worry about the tree branch falling on your head, but you don't. Interest payments on the United States government debt is not in your top 10, I promise you. Okay, that's fair. Um, you know, after after in the intro talking about how no, 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 I'm not, I'm not pessimistic here. I'm kind of feeding all the pessimists. Okay. It's all right. I'm playing, I'm playing devil's advocate yeah, here. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, you know, to get your your take on these things. I'll I'll do uh, at least one more. There's one more that I think about a lot, which is okay. If stocks have, if there's a, let's say an equity risk premium or whatever it is, stocks are meant to outperform, by and large, they'll have, they'll have setbacks. So by and large, uh, you can expect stocks to outperform, uh, let's say, GDP growth or inflation or some kind of measure of economic growth. Well, you know, like everything else, if you extrapolate that and compound it and extrapolate it, you know, for infinity years, yeah. you, get to, you get to a ridiculous point. It has to kind of come back every so often. And, and the framework... I often think about to express that is the Buffett indicator, which is uh, global market cap or, or you know, domestic market cap to, to GDP. And, you know, it basically says that, you know, GDP growth, uh, the the market should by and large eventually kind of true up to some, you know, normalized ratio relative to, uh, um, you know, the, the country as a whole, the GDP. Yep. And historically, it's been about, you know, market cap is averaged to be about 90% of GDP. Right now, it's like doubles, about yep. 180 um, does that scare you in, in, a, in a significant way? Yeah, so what this is like, we're comparing total market cap of all US stocks with the quarterly output of the economy, called the kind of the Buffett valuation indicator. Um, yeah, it's about 193% right now at the end of February, which, yeah, I mean, that's it's certainly, certainly way higher than it's been in history. Uh, one of the things I learned as an equity trader, um, engaging with, portfolio managers and engaging with institutional clients was that valuation models can be really tricky because um, they're, they're not very good timing tools, right? Saying something's expensive, saying something's cheap. Very, very tough to do. Oftentimes when you're looking at something in the past, like CAPE, like you look with CAPE just to get everybody's on the same page is this kind of another valuation metric by Robert Schiller from Yale about trying to compare cyclically adjusted price earnings. Again, another fancy term. Um, these things don't, really perform well due to composition effects. And when I say composition effects, is the US economy the same today as it was in 1980? Certainly not, right? In terms of manufacturing or high tech or consumer spending or housing. So composition effects in the economy can really throw these things into whack because it's tough to compare 2024 to even 2016 or even to 20, 2007 or 1998 or whatever. Um, I do believe in mean reversion, Phil. I, I don't think that stock prices can go up infinitely in a straight line. Like I. Well, again, Morgan Housel says there's, you know, if, if stocks ever sold off, they'd get expensive, okay? They'd get super expensive. And what happens to expensive things? They're prone to crashing. Like, so that would happen. Like, that's that's the very definition of, of mean reversion. Um, I generally don't like to look at valuation models and try to make some sort of guess about where it's going to go in the near term or where it's going to go in the next six, 12 months. I do believe, back to my expectations, that those two bear markets reset that. Those two bear markets are meant to pull those valuations back, are meant to pull uh, those indicators back into back into line. And again, we just had one. Um, I'm looking at I'm looking at what happened in 2022, and that that Buffett indicator fell dramatically in 2022. It did yeah. um, because valuations reset a bit. So I, they're they're good questions, Phil. And I think ultimately, I'm going to say this, and then I'll kick it back to you. I think it's very very easy to have a million worries. And, and those million worries can be valuation indicators or the national debt, or they can be a central bank digital currency, or they can be, um, you know, they, they can be a war. They, there's a very easy to have a million worries and you could actually paralyze yourself. 
very, very easy by saying these three things upset me. So I'm, therefore I'm just going to stay on the sidelines or I'm going to, or I'm going to think about investing in gold or something else. Anyway, um, there will never be a perfect version of the world where stocks are cheap, where the party that you want to be in power holds power, where the national debt is low, where there's no wars, where the price of energy is low, where there's no, where there's no headlines. The if there world was, does not exist. Worry, we find other things to complain about. I promise. Yeah, you. I sort of got in 2017, the stock market went straight up. I mean, you remember 2017? It was one of the best years in history. During that year, I remember people saying, I'm worried that there's nothing to worry about. So something must be wrong. Like they, that was actually a thing in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's this trope online, this, this thing like, like, oh, you know, that's kind of, kind of been going around over the last few months, like, oh, perma bears, um, people that are always doom and gloom. It's a great way to get clicks, great way to get newspaper yeah. subscriptions or, you know, and, and, and a feeling that especially with the market up and with um, people who've been bearish having been wrong for so long, we're a straight shot since, you know, since the COVID crash, um, like they're disingenuous. They, they're almost, you know, they're, they're just there to, you know, to, you know, sell newsletter subscriptions. Yeah. This is the way to do it. Yeah. Get more attention that way. Um, do you think that's the case? I, I actually, I mean, it, this is a great question. It's really right up my alley. Uh, so my pin tweet, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm at Bowen Baird is pessimists sound smart. Optimists make money. Uh, and I believe, Phil, that it is optimal to be bearish. And, and let me just let me just say why I think it's optimal to be bearish, okay? It's optimal to be bearish because if the stock market goes down and you told people it's going to go down, they're going to think you're a genius, okay? They're going to give you legendary status. You're going to go on CNBC. You're going to be, you're going to be the one who called it, okay? You're going to absolutely elevate your brand and you're going to elevate your exposure dramatically because you were the one that called it and you saved people money and, oh my God, this person, I'm going to follow them forever. What if the stock market goes up? Okay, what if it goes up instead of down? Well, in that case, people are making money and they really don't care, okay? They're making money. The stock market's going up. They, great. The, the stock market's going up. The economy's probably improving. I'm making money. Who made a call? I don't remember what call that person made, but I'm making money, so I really don't care. So it's actually optimal from, from a, a strategic point of view to just always be bearish because it's a kind of a win-win for you. Um, but, but I do believe that, I mean, how, how much money has been, has been kind of removed from investors' pockets by accounts who constantly promote worry and doom and gloom? I mean, Zero Hedge has probably, probably crushed tr billions of dollars from investor accounts. And, and look, I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't exist. Like, I don't begrudge their brand. Like, their brand is, is negativity. Their brand is, is pointing out things that are wrong. And you know what? You, there's two sides to a trade, okay? There's two sides. There's somebody who wants the thing to go up and somebody wants the thing to go down or, or wants out of it. So I don't begrudge people that are negative, but I do think that in essence, in, in it, when you boil it all down, um, negativity sells. That's the reason why the news is so popular. That's the reason why uh, if you were to look online that I only have 32,000 followers, so I don't have that many. I, I, not that many at all. If you were to go to some of the big bears, they're in the hundreds of thousands. So it's just, I think it is true. So negativity sells. I mean, it does. So, you know, like, like within that, you know, so what about positivity? Do you think positivity, I mean, I, I would, I would say this, I would say I'm, I'm guessing that it's not, it's not just about, you know, quantity, number yeah. of followers, number of clicks. Yeah. It's also about quality, right? You want yes. to have the right people, the people that matter. You want to have the people that you, you know, that you want to interact with. Those are the people that you want to, um, that you want to reach. Um, do you feel like positivity brings in kind of, you know, you put out the good vibes, you get higher quality. Yeah. And, yeah. Do, do you think that's the case? I do. I, I've, I have DMS from people that are like, you say, like, I follow you and I, I, I love everything you're saying. And, and they're like, it, it's, it's cool to have somebody in my feed who, again, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture or nonsense. I don't, I'm not, my feed's not full of flowers and like, everything's great. And like, I mean, I went to Purdue and I was despondent last night when Purdue lost in the title game. So I, I'm not, so not all like roses and, but you're right. The, the quality, like maybe my 32,000 are people who are really, really uh, using me as a benchmark uh, indicator. And, and I would think that's great. And maybe, maybe the people with 400,000 are just all bots and just all, you know, it's, it doesn't have a high quality, um, high quality signal, but I, let me say this. And I don't know, I'd love to get your take on this too, Phil. I, I think in life, okay. In general, in, in your personal life, in your professional life or whatever, there's, there's probably about five to six people that you listen to. 
okay? Five to six. And those five to six can really can really impact the way you think about the world and, and money and relationships and love and whatever. And I bet, Phil, you could, you could list the five or six that are important to you. And I bet all our listeners could too. I probably could. Um, if that's the case, if there's five to six people that really, really mold and shape the way you think, you have to be thoughtful about that five to six, not only from a financial perspective, from a diversity perspective, from an age perspective, all of it. Because if you surround yourself with four or five people who are, I don't know, older and negative, you might miss cool trends that younger people are seeing. If you find yourself surrounded by a bunch of optimists, you might think that the world's great and you get blindsided by something bad that happens. So I, I do follow permanent bear. I follow permanent, I follow bearish people. What am I missing? Like what in my viewpoint is wrong? Um, but I do think you need to be thoughtful about the five to six. And hopefully I'm in some people's five to six and they're using me as a, man, maybe things aren't as bad as I thought. Maybe, maybe that helps people get through a day. I think this this podcast is a good case in point because like I said, when economics said, oh, you know, you're coming across so negative, I immediately thought of you. It's like, well, let me let me talk to Michael. Let me kind yeah. of like reset and, and bring in, you know, some of that case. So, so yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I have, you know, certainly, look, my father's no longer with us, but I always, every time I think of a new investment methodology i'm like well would he would it pass his smell test that's kind of like yeah. me, my gauge and you know th there there are certain people that certainly carry a lot more weight than others and you know in terms of like how we you know how we gauge feedback or how we think about you know different you know test different ideas i mean twitter is such a great place to test hypotheses to test ideas test messaging i put things out there sometimes i'm like yeah let's let's kind of you know let's see what the feedback is on this idea on this concept on this you know whatever it is um, not to say that it's disingenuous. I try very hard to be authentic, but like, you know, sometimes I think something I'm like, yeah, am I missing something or not? You know, you yeah. put it out there and you get instant feedback from some incredible people. Some, uh, yeah. you know, some total assholes, of course, goes with the territory, but you know, the, the feedback mechanism is unreal. I, I think that if you curate Twitter correctly, and again, it can be, it can be accessible. I think if you curate it correctly, it can be very, very powerful. I, I have made some deep, deep, professional and, and personal relationships off of Twitter. And, and, you know, I, th there, there's probably 30 people I talk to on a regular basis and maybe three or four of them, I consider them quasi friends or enough that, Hey, let's go to dinner, that kind of a thing. Um, I never would have met Morgan House if it wasn't for Twitter. And he's one of the most uh, important influences in my life in terms of how I write and how I create content. And, and we talk all the time about what, what are things that are persistent through time? You wrote a book called Same as Ever, and I talk to him all the time. What are the things that are same as ever? What if, if Phil, if we don't know what the future holds, then we really need to understand what will never change throughout history. And what will never change is tribalism. That will never change throughout all of recorded history. It's from the past. It will go all the way into the future. If tribalism is something that will never change and greed and fear is something that will never change, how can I communicate with people that aren't in my tribe? How can I communicate with clients who are overcome with fear and greed? If you can, if you can focus on the things that never change in human history, you can start to predict the future because you know it's going to come back again. Um, so anyway, I think to your point, Twitter is a very, very powerful. I mean, we never would have met if it wasn't for Twitter, and, and we follow each other. And I look at your stuff, and you look at my stuff. And if even at, at the edges of our thinking, the other person can have an impact, it's powerful, and and it and it and it can shape the way both you and I interact. The best, the best interactions, the best people on 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 Twitter are the ones with whom I find myself sometimes agreeing, sometimes disagreeing, but in a respectful, constructive yeah. way. We kind of get. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? If we're all sitting around agreeing with each other, it's just boring. Yeah. There's no value, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's not um, like you know, right? But but we learn, and and I'm you know, I I love having my mind changed. That's a when 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 I change my mind about something, that's like. That's one of the best feelings. It's like, oh, an epiphany. Like, oh, I never saw this point of view, but now it's that's like an enlightenment. That's a great feeling. And I'm, you know, I love having my mind changed, and and I do all the time. I get I get things wrong. I change my mind pretty pretty regularly. Um, yeah, yeah. That's the the hallmark of somebody who's intelligent is the ability to change your mind. It really is. And and I, I've always said, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. And, and I think that's true universally. Um, but if if you're interacting with somebody who refuses to budge on on any topic, then they've just showed you who they are. They showed you they're not kind of intellectually curious. They just have a point of view, and they're just going to stick to it. And um, I agree. I want to change my mind too. There there are moments when I look at the when I look at the world and say, what am I getting wrong? Like, what am I missing? And and am I missing it for the next month, or am I missing it for the next year? Just to circle way way back to our point about people with different time frames. Um, 
Look, I think that's super crucial to remember. The people that I engage with in private wealth have much, much longer timeframes than an, an equity, you know, an equity manager. Uh, a portfolio manager cares about a stock for the next quarter. And if 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 that's the case and my client cares about it for the next decade and a sovereign wealth fund cares about it for the next 50 years, should their expectations about the price of the security all line up? No, of course they shouldn't. Like if I'm predicting where Apple will be in 50 years as opposed to next quarter, there's no way the price will ever line up between the between the quarterly fund manager and the sovereign wealth fund. Um, so just remember that everybody, like that people have different time frames. You're not necessarily all, we're not all necessarily talking about the same thing. Last question, Michael, you, you've learned these lessons about communicating and storytelling, um, about positivity, about, you know, you've learned these lessons through writing about the markets. Have those lessons extended to your, you know, to your life outside of the markets, outside of work? Um, and, and if so, you know, have they had any impact on, on how you see the world in your life? Yeah, they have. I, I, Look, it's easy to complain, right? It's, it's easy to complain that something's unfair. It's easy to complain that the weather sucks, or it's easy to complain that something's going wrong and, and it, it, it affects the way you deal with your family or it affects the way you deal with your friends or your career. And one of the things I've tried really hard is as, as I go through this kind of mid, mid, you know, midlife crisis, this midlife turning 50, is that people like to be around people that don't complain. People like to be around friendly faces to, to be able to inspire somebody or to be able to make them laugh, I think is super powerful, super, super powerful. Nobody wants to sit down with a friend and have them say, here's what I think is going wrong. Or, or have that friend be like, hey, I'm worried about a war overseas. Or I'm, hey, I'm worried about um, the stock market crashing. Like if you can bring a little bit of light to some people's world, you can make a huge impact on them. Huge. And Again, I don't I don't want everybody to be like Mike Antonelli, the you know, the the hopeless optimist who just thinks everything's great and is irresponsibly telling people that everything's gonna be fine. But I do deeply believe, deeply, deeply, deeply believe that most things turn out fine. They really do. Not everything, but most things do turn out fine. Again, not sometimes it doesn't, and, and that can be the case in health or relationships or or the world, but most things do work out fine. That's why humanity has advanced over the over the thousands of years that we've been alive. That's because because we work slowly to improve ourselves and, and the world and try to you know claw back the setbacks that we all have. But um, I just want people that that follow me to at least know that there's there's somebody out there looking on the bright side of things. I love it. It's great, great place to leave it. Where can people find your blog yeah. and and follow your writing? Yeah, so at Bull and Baird, our firm name uh, on Twitter, and Baird has a uh, obviously Baird has its own website, and I produce content on there. And Baird has a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and type R W Baird, I'll be on there too. But if you follow me on Twitter, or if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see all my content. I, I funnel it down those channels when I produce it, and and I just want to thank you so much, Phil. This has been great. I hope that uh, that you and I have you know another decade worth of interactions, and we learn from each other because I think that we'll both be better off. Likewise, I appreciate you very much. Thank you for coming on. Thank you to the audience for your time and attention. And we've got some really special guests coming up. So uh, if you're not, make sure you are subscribed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Phil Bach Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to drop a review. This show was published for entertainment purposes only and is not investment advice. Please contact a licensed professional before making any investments. Some of the securities discussed on the show may be owned by its participants. Opinions expressed on the show may not reflect those of their employers. Stay hungry and stay foolish.